Hi everyone, welcome to the Chat Club Podcast. I'm your host, Alan Hilchie. Today is going to be number episode number 16. I'm going to be focusing on suicide preventative ways and just a definition and what it's about and a lot of different things surrounding suicide and some of my views. I have a new website that's up and running. It's on my Facebook page, uh, on Chat Club Facebook page. I do have my website there. Um, I do have it there just so everyone can see, gives a little bio of myself, talks about my sponsors, and talks about a little different things. And also, you can stream my uh, latest episodes and my old episodes from the website. So I just thought I'd uh, throw that out there. Thought it'd be a little more uh, interesting, a little more uh, fluent for people to search me up and, you know. Maybe I'll get some more people listening through my website. I'm hoping on that. So you can also share my website, share my Facebook. Love to have a lot of likes. I'd like to get a lot more, but we're working on it. It's a you know a slow pace. I've told that uh, podcasting is, is a slow process. So I'm okay with that. So firstly, I'd like to thank my local sponsors. I have some sponsors that have sponsored me for this episode. I have Carpet One for all your carpet needs or a local machine company. And I also have Patterson's. And Patterson's does a lot of RV sales, uh, ATV sales, do a lot of parts and sales and stuff like that. They're local in the Mary Machine, so I'd like to take a shout out to them. Thank you very much for, you know, breaking the, joining me and breaking the silence in mental health. Please check my sponsors on my webpage as I do have links that shows what services they do have. Please do. I'd love to have some more, you know, more traffic for them. I'd appreciate that. This episode, I'm going to be, you know, focusing everything on suicide here. Uh, no doubt, it's an awkward, awkward subject. No one likes to talk about it. It's one of the hardest subjects to talk about. So I've got the suicide definition. I have the Webster Dictionary, and the suicide definition is the act or an instance of taking one's own life, voluntary or intentionally, especially by a person. Years of discretion end of sound mind. So the Oxford Dictionary also has a definition of the action of killing oneself intentionally. And another definition is called dictionary.com, the intention of taking of one's life. So those are the different definitions of what the Webster's and a lot of the other ones talk about. So I'm going to get into suicidal ideation. Suicidal ideation is different. It's a term used by mental health professionals to describe suicidal thoughts and feelings without the suicidal actions, of course. For example, people experiencing suicidal ideation commonly report that they feel worthless, that life is not worth living, and the world would be better off without them. The presence of suicide ideation occurring alone in the absence of any plans or to act out act out the actual suicide anchors the low low uh, low less danger end of suicide risk continuum so just a lot less just that you have a lot of thoughts of it the potential of someone for someone to engage in suicide is still there but the risk is not immediate so that that's something to think about you can have those thoughts everybody has them it's normal to have these thoughts people have these thoughts on a daily basis even though suicide ideations considered less serious than the actual suicide attempts, it can be a real cause for concern. The fact that suicidal ideation is occurring at all suggests a very real possibility that suicide could occur should the circumstances become worse or the stress levels mount becoming worse. Anyone who has cited suicidal ideation is someone at risk of becoming actively suicidal. Furthermore, the, the problem is that once suicidal ideation has been established, it can become a cognitive habit, something that reappears periodically or spontaneously during times of success as an automatic or habitual negative dysfunctional style of thinking. Such dis- dysfunctional automatic thinking styles are especially common with people who are currently oppressed who are recovering from a previous period of depression. The continuing presence of such styles of the thinking in a person 
has recovered from a depression that can be a risk factor or further depression or suicidal gestures. So we're going to get into the risk factors and warning signs. So before I get into this, I want to talk about my personal experience, um, not with suicide, but just my cultural or how I thought of suicide. I thought about this when I was younger. I thought that people were weak. I thought people were being selfish. They were being not thinking about anybody else. So as I've got older, I've, yeah, I'm old now. So when I have some experience in life, I've really come to the understanding of why people get depressed. I've had some anxiety, I've had different things. I've been depressed. Not a high depression, but I have been due to my job being corrections. What it really fascinates me is how I went from being somebody that frowned upon and looked upon and thought it was a stigma that, you know, these people, if they're going to take their life, they're, they're being selfish, they're being this, they're being that. I come from that to now today being more empathetic and more understanding of why people get to where they get. They don't want to kill themselves for the sake of killing themselves. They, they just want to get rid of the pain that they're feeling. And nobody knows the pain. So we talk about the pain. We talk about anybody is anybody can be suicidal. Anybody can attempt suicide. Anyone can be that person. So when you see people that, like, I mean, for instance, we look at a lot of different celebrities. We look at Robin Williams. Robin Williams is probably the one of the funniest people in history. People didn't know what demons he did because he made people laugh. And when you laugh, you don't look at the other person. You're laughing at what they say. You're not seeing the pain. Biggest thing about having that pain is it's all internal. There's no wounds on the exterior. I've talked about this several times in my podcast about the pain that people feel, but there's no wounds. You don't see the wounds. You didn't see lacerations in Robin Williams. You didn't see the pain. But his daughter seen the pain. She understood the pain. So when we come to this whole thing about suicide, is the biggest thing is you don't know what they're feeling or how they're feeling. And now my experience with suicide is so much better. I've taken classes on it due to my work I have to have. Because when we have people that are incarcerated, the more up to be suicidal thoughts and a lot of ideation and a lot of suicide due to their situation, drugs, uh, negative situations in their family, just different things, low self-esteem, depression. The clientele all have this. So me as a correctional, myself as a correctional officer, I have to be the one that helps them out. And that's my job, is to help people. And we do get training, which is pretty good. I must say that the training that we did take for suicide intervention, it's called ASSIST. So it's really good. I really enjoyed it. It does different scenarios. It puts you in the scenarios where you have to talk people out of certain things. And when I started working corruption, I started to understand. I started to see people at their lows. I started to see what they're, what what's affecting them and why they're seeing and why why they're being suicidal thoughts and why they think in their lives they're worthless. I started to understand. Don't understand directly with the person because I'm not in their shoes. But I, what I did understand is why do they have these thoughts? What 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 has led up to people having suicidal thoughts or ideations or different things? So I just wanted to say that this is my feelings. Now I'm more empathetic, and I what is really bothering me in the world is how many young people are committing suicide or attempting nowadays, more so than I've seen in a long time. Maybe because I'm paying more attention to it because of what I've seen in my community. There was a couple people in my community that committed suicide. They had no help. The mental health is starting to gradually get better, but it needs to, needs a boost, it needs a steroid, it needs to really come up. Because, I mean, I talked to, to uh, Natalie Way in my podcast earlier that her daughter attempted suicide, is was in intensive care for nine days. And I'm going to have the pleasure of interviewing her in the new year, which I really look forward to, because I want to tap into her, because she has a lot of information. Lola has a lot of information to help other young adults or teenagers that go through this sort of feelings and, and can't process them. So she might be able to help some people. And this is what this podcast is about. I'm not about making millions of dollars. I'm about bringing information, thoughts, and 
telling people that they're worth it and telling people that I care on the podcast and I want you to stay safe. And I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here in the person. So that's what I want to say. I will probably further explain this at the end. So I'm going to get into risk factors and warning signs. So the biggest question is what leads to suicide? There's no single cause for suicide. Suicide often occurs when stressors and health issues start to create an experience of hopelessness and despair in the person. Depression is the most common condition associated with suicide, and it is often undiagnosed or untreated as people are professionals when they mask this. People don't like to show their feelings. and They don't want to stress other people out that they're having suicidal thoughts. They feel they don't want to make the other person feel awkward. Conditions like depression, anxiety, substance abuse problems, especially when unaddressed, increase risk for suicide. That's common sense. When, you know, those type of factors come into play, there's a higher chance of suicide. Absolutely. Yet it's important to note that most people who are actively manage their mental health conditions can go on to engage in life. So, I mean, they can fake it till they make it and they can still be a part of life. So, once we get into what leads to suicide, no one really knows what the cause is. I mean, there's variables, there's a lot of different things. There's money, uh, a partner could cheat it on them. They could have like a, a illness that is terminal or a lot of different things. There's so many variables in life that can lead people to, and people adapt differently. People just process things differently. And that's why we're all unique individuals. Suicide warning signs. So when we look at this, we're looking at something to look out for when we're concerned that a person may be suicide, suicidal is a change in behavior or the presence of entirely new behaviors. This is of sharp, sharpest concern if the new or changed behavior is related to a painful event, loss, or change. Could be a death in the family, could be anything that lost a job, like a high paying job, there's a lot of different variables. Most people who take their lives exhibit one or more warning signs, either through what they say or what they do. So here are some of them that I've come across. Increasing use of alcohol or drugs, changing the normal routine, eating or sleeping patterns that are disruptive, or they sleep a lot or don't sleep. Doing risky or self-destructive things such as using drugs or driving recklessly or doing things that are very reckless, not really what they really do in life. It's kind of different, a change in behavior. Giving away belongings or getting affairs in order when there's no other logical explanation for doing this. They're setting their state aside or telling people that they can have you know, their prized possession. These are all warning signs. Saying goodbye to the person if they won't see them again. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer, but some people don't look past what the message is sometimes they just think people are being kind of oh they're just saying that but it is a warning sign be very vigilant on this developing personality changes are severely anxious or agitated particularly when experience some of the warning signs above warning signs aren't always obvious because you think it's part of the it's just a normal thing they say it and it's just you don't take it serious because we don't take suicide serious and we don't think that people are going to do this sort of thing. It's really, so it may vary from person to person. Some people may make their intentions very clear while others keep their suicidal thoughts and feelings to themselves. Talk. So talk, basically, if the person talks about killing themselves, feeling hopelessness, having no reason to live, being a burden, uh, bur being a burden on others, feeling trapped, unbearable pain is also a sign. Behavior. Behavioral that may signal risk, especially if they're related to a painful event, loss, or change. So this person has increased the use of drugs and alcohol, looking for a way to end their lives, such as searching online for methods of killing themselves, withdrawing from activities, isolating from family and friends, sleeping too much or sleeping too little, visiting or calling people to say goodbye, and giving away their prized possessions. So a lot of other things could be stressful life events like rejection, divorce, 
financial crisis, other life transitions, loss, exposure to other, to another person's suicide, or graphic or sensationalized accounts of suicide. So these are some other things. So also other things can be like, could be their sexuality. Uh, I know this has come, a lot of people, like gay people or bisexual people, transgender people, non-gender, have a lot of suicidal thoughts because it's not a norm of society. It's starting, really starting to become more normal in society and and I'm glad it is because people have identity, identity crisis and they don't understand and they have feelings of being something else and that's just the way it is. And my whole thing is um, be yourself. If that's who you are, be who you are. Really doesn't matter what other people think because at the end of the day, you have to live and look yourself in the mirror and you have to be proud of who you are and who you stand up and be proud of who you are because it's very important. And I think a lot of people get lost in the translation of worrying about what other people think. And that comes from media, celebrities, you have to be a certain prototype or a certain person, but a lot of this different those things, these events and factors, you have to take, you have to understand people are people. We have to accept people for who they are. Uh, and I really think it's a fundamental thing. So when we get into other things, you may be at risk for suicide if, obviously, if you attempted suicide before. Again, feeling hopeless, worthless, agitated, socially isolated, or lonely. Experienced a stressful event, life event, such as the loss of a loved one, military service, a breakup, financial or legal problems. Have a substance abuse problem, alcohol and drug can even worsen thoughts of suicide, makes you feel reckless or impulsive, even enough to act on your own thoughts. Having suicidal thoughts and having access to firearms in, in your own home, having an underlying psychiatric disorder, such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, bipolar disorder. These are high, high risks. Having a family history of mental disorders Substance abuse, suicide, violence, including sexual or physical abuse. Having a medical condition to be linked to depression and suicidal thought or chronic disease, chronic pain, or terminally illness. Are a lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender with a very unsupportive family in a hostile environment is also one. Boys, it's real tough for people to understand you know, it's really hard for people that have this sort of thing. Another thing we're going to get into, these are historical factors. Uh, previous attempt, family history of suicide, uh, child abuse, neglect, or trauma. And trauma could be a part of it. Not dealing with the trauma can bring on this suicidal thoughts too. Like if you get physically abused, sexually abused, you think it's your fault and it's not your fault. So when we get into the other warning signs, warning signs that might suggest that someone's at risk of suicide, thinking or talking about suicide, having a plan for suicide. Other signs and behaviors that may suggest that someone is at risk. So I'm gonna go through this again. I know this is repetitive, but some people like to hear this over and over. They withdraw from family, friends, or activities. Feeling like you have no purpose in life, reason for living, Increased substance abuse, like drugs and alcohol. Feeling trapped or there's no way out of the situation. Feeling hopeless about a future. Feeling like life will never get better. We all feel that way. Talking about being a burden to someone or being in unbearable pain. Anxiety, significant mood changes, such as anger, sadness, or helplessness. So some of the symptoms of suicide can be examples. I want to say some examples, talking about suicide. For example, making statements such as, I'm going to call this, kill myself. I wish I were dead. I wish I wasn't born. These are signs. Getting the means to take your own life, such as buying a gun, stocking, stockpiling pills, withdrawing from a social contract, and wanting to be left alone. Having mood swings, such as emotionally high one day, and deeply discouraged the next. 
being preoccupied with death, dying, or violence, feeling trapped or hopelessness about a situation, being aggressive or very fatigued. People, and we're going to get into the mood, people that considered often suicidal often display one or more of the mood, following moods, depression, anxiety, loss of interest, irritability, humiliation, shame, agitation, anger, relief. Those are some of them. Risk factors. We need more into risk factors. And we have the mental health factors, uh, mental health conditions, depression, substance abuse, uh, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, personality traits of aggression, mood swings, poor relationships, conduct disorder, anxiety disorders, serious health conditions, including pain, traumatic brain injury, can alter your thinking. So we're gonna lead into environmental factors. And there's only a couple. Excess to lethal means, such as firearms and drugs. Prolonged stress, such as harassment, bullying, relationship problems or unemployment are key factors to suicide. Bullying is one of the main things for kids to commit suicide because they constantly feel the pain and have no way to get rid of it and are scared to talk about it. We just had a kid, I watched a video on Facebook about a kid getting thrown around that was probably four foot nothing, a hundred and some pounds and this big kid was throwing this other kid around and it made me want to reach the screen and hug the kid and protect the kid. Now people are out giving out on Facebook, giving free classes to kids. Why does it have to take such an aggressive thing in a visual for people to realize that bullying is there? Bullying is an epidemic that needs to be squashed and people need to take it serious in order for people to government or teachers or districts to take a stand. And these kids lead to suicide because of the bullying, because of years of traumatic events that lead up to this. And kids that want to die and feel empty because they get nothing but negativity thrown on them, thrown around, physically hit, mean words, all of this stuff. What is it going to take? A visual? Some kid dying? Oh, let's put up a bullying day. No. This needs to be done now. It needs to be taken care of now. This is serious stuff. And you know, kids understand a lot more. Oh, I don't want to use the big words like suicide. Suicide's not a scary word. It's, just, it's, a, it's, it's a word to describe someone in pain. It's a word to describe somebody that wants to end their life because of the pain. So we have to help people. We have to help them through the, the tough. Are you suicidal? Ask the question. It's a scary question, but I've asked it numerous times, and you get a pit in your stomach, and you feel awkward. Ask the question, are you suicidal? Why are you suicidal? What makes you think that way? Then they explain that. Then they talk about it. And sometimes it's all it takes. And in my my assist training, it talks about ambivalence, ambivalence of the person that is suicidal. They're on the river. They're on the river going down the stream and they're not fully committed to committing suicide, but they're on the river, which means they're falling down and they're thinking about it. And sometimes people, as scary as it is, sometimes just people want people to listen, to say it's gonna be okay. I hear you, I understand you. I understand what you're saying. What can I do to help? They sometimes people just want to vent. They want to listen. But it's also good that you get a social contract with these people or with close relatives, people, coworkers, students, and do a verbal social contract to listen. For 24 hours, I want you to, but the biggest thing with suicide, like I'm gonna talk, I'm getting off track, but the suicidal is you need to know if they're talking suicide, yes, I'm suicidal. Next thing you know, you need to ask is, do you have a plan? When they have a plan and they have it like, I'm gonna hang myself and I have the rope planted and da 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 da. Serious stuff. Uh, when they have a plan, that means they're pretty close to doing it, which means you have to ask them about the plan. Then the social contract comes in and you ask them, I don't want you to 
I want you to keep yourself safe for 24 hours and think about this for 24 hours. They call me back. Can you make that contract with me? And the social contract is something where it's a promise between two people. And sometimes it really works because then the person has a conscience. That's something to focus on besides suicide. Not only that, someone cares. Someone really cares. Someone's listening. That's what people want. They want to be heard. And sometimes people are suicidal and do commit suicide because that's the end of it. Sometimes you can't do nothing about it. But there's a high percentage of people that you can do. So how to help someone in crisis? Talking honestly, responsibly, and safe about suicide can help you determine if someone needs help. If you want to help someone, try listening, showing concern, being fully focused on them, eye contact. Showing concern might be the immediate way to help someone. Listening might not increase the risk of suicide. It may save a life. Absolutely may save a life. Talking with them and reassuring them that they're not alone. That is huge with any mental health, any issues that people feel alone. To know that they're not alone. Huge impact on the psychic of somebody that feels alone, um, feels like a burden. Letting them know that you care. I care that you're going to do this. I want you to live. You're, this place is a better place with you in it. All the things that they need to hear that you want to say. You know, connecting them with a crisis line. There's so many crisis lines of suicide. People that are trained in it, if you don't feel acceptable, and I'm going to talk about it at the end. I have some helplines, but having some helplines and you know, having some suicide hotlines or mental health hotlines and there's might be a mobile crisis unit around in your community that you call and the crisis unit comes to help the person. Huge, absolutely. It's like a service that comes to you and we pay taxes in this world and in our countries to have these services and they should be there for people. Talking to a counselor, having a counselor, like lining them up with a counselor. Um, I know of a counselor that can help you with this. Um, would you let me help you find a counselor that would suit your needs? Um, what do you have at work for an you know, employee assistance program? I can help you with that. Let's go get the number of call right now, and I'll be here as your support system. Those are the things people need. They need support, caring, understanding, taking away the stigma of how they feel. Because this is what mental health is about. It's a stigma. It's how people view them. They don't want to be viewed that way as, a, as an outcast. And that's how people feel. Trust person, neighbor, family member, elder, native elders. First Nations people have a high rate of suicide. But when they reach into their elders and their, and their community and their culture, it helps. So if you are First Nations, please tap into an elder. They deal with this stuff. They have experience dealing with family members that have a history of suicide that are still alive and still deal with it. That could be a help for that person. So many helpful things that you can do. So many different different variables. And that's huge in the life that we live. And we have to be that way. Because at the end of the day, we just have people helping people, being a part of it. So when we look at this, so I've looked at risk factors. I've looked at some symptoms. Um, you know, I've looked at, you know, people, there's other symptoms that you should look at. I'm gonna throw the symptoms out there and I just found this and I'm talking about it. Suicide risk and warnings and suicidal thoughts include doing, you know, changing their normal routine, including eating and status, sleeping patterns, doing risky self-destructive, you know, behaviors. I've talked about all this, but it's important to, to, to watch this being preoccupied with death or dying, even if they're researching death or suicidal or, or watching movies about suicide or different things. Uh, just make sure, you know, that people. And the biggest thing is children and teenagers are the, one of the highest risks of suicide. Suicide in children and teenagers is, is one of the highest, you know, which... We have to, you know, we have to look at, you know, suicide trends, look for clues, 
we have to, you know, be vigilant. If you're a parent, then look at different clues. Sometimes you're not looking for them. But if you see odd things in rooms or a different behavior or they start acting a little different, then we really have to focus on the well-being of the person and what is going on with the person. So and that's one of the biggest things is recognizing the behaviors and trying to help someone in crisis. Huge, absolutely huge. So I'm going to get into Canadian stats and I want to talk about the Canadian because that's where I'm from, Canada. But there's so many different different stats on suicide and I'm pretty sure that a lot of the different countries correlate. Um, in third world countries, it could be a lot higher suicide rate because of the third world and the poverty and different things. So many various factors in suicide. Suicide key stats in Canada are, are just massive. Um, more than I'd like to see, I would have to say, or anybody. Death and hospitalizations. Approximately 11 people die by suicide each day. Approximately 4,000 deaths by suicide per year. One third of deaths by suicide are among people from the ages of 45 to 59 years old. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among youth and young adults from ages 15 to 34 years. Suicide rates are approximately three times higher among men compared to women. So the reason why I think that is because men are genetically and socially trained not to show their feelings because they keep it in and they get to a point where, you know, they lose their feelings and they have so much pain and they have no outlets because men aren't supposed to show their feelings. I do. I'm okay with this. I have feelings. I grieve over my father's death. I have anxiety. I have had anxiety. I've dealt with it. I deal with it on a daily basis. Much better in my life. No medication. I'm very lucky. I just know how to manage it for some reason. It does get bad some days, but I still manage it. Death rates of suicide per 100,000 is, is staggering. So when I get into the different sites, um, I want to get into the site. I wonder where that is. But when we talk about suicide, we talk about different validities. We talk about different different stats, different suicide rates, and what really attributes to suicide. So I'm going to go into the Canadian suicide stats here. Uh, it's usually published, and we have an overview. Stats Canada really has this sort of thing. So I know there's a lot of different stats. So we're going to get into the higher rate of suicide. Now this is off the Canadian website here. So in 2009, there were 3,890 uh, 3, suicides in Canada. Suicides in Canada are rated 11.5% per 100,000 people. So that's pretty high. Now they talked about the three times higher for men over females. So that's that's a high rate. Although suicide deaths affect almost all age groups, the highest rates are from 40 to 59. So this is an area where people change jobs, lose jobs, their kids move out, uh, try to pay for university for the kid, different validities. There's so many different common factors. Mental illness, mental or marital break breakdowns, financial hardship, deteriorating physical health, a major loss, a father, a parent, could be a brother, sister, uh, grieving, a low uh, lack of social support. And these are some factors that can help. When we talk about different things and the methods of suicide and uh, methods of sex and age, ooh, this is really. So over the past 10 years, the most common method of suicide in Canada has been hanging at 44%, which includes strangulation, suffocation, followed by poisoning at 25% and using a firearm at 16. Males are more likely to commit suicide by hanging at 46%, percent 
while female females most often die by poisoning, which could be by drugs, uh, could be by affirmation by the car, different things like that. 20% were far more likely to use firearms than females. So males at 20%, females at 3%. Now I'm getting into a stigma, but men do a lot of hunting and do a lot more with guns than, than females. That's just an observation, not, not putting out there the stereotypes or anything like that. So I'm not getting that. The highest rates of suicide are during midlife. So like I said, 40 to 59. So we're heading to midlife crisis. In this group, there was 1769 out of 3,890 in this group that were at that age, compared with 35% that were 15 to 39 and 19 over the age of 60. So the 19% out of the 3,890 were seniors, um, probably on their deathbed or a lot of different, very terminally ill, uh, just a lot of different variables variables so so this is the end of my podcast i'm going to just in conclusion just get my views on it uh, my views on suicide is simple people need help they look in there just pinned in a corner and have nowhere to look and that's where we as people have to notice this stuff sometimes we get so busy in our lives that we don't see people in their mood swings or their changes or their certain different behavior changes and their sleeping pattern, your eating patterns. But if you notice that stuff, it's okay to ask people if you're okay. And they may come out and just talk. And maybe that's all they need. But when it really comes down to it, suicide is such a such a preventable thing. Most of the time, I'm not going to say all the time, but most of the time, it can be very preventable. So in my inclusion here, I've, I've looked online for some help stuff. And I've seen a site that just blows my mind away. It's called the thelifelinecanada.ca. And what this site has, it has the guides, the toolkits, resources through the site that represent uh, complication of suicide prevention resources, uh, various resources across the globe. Uh, when clicking their third party that put them into the websites that you're in, like, Right here it has crisis centers, it has the Canadian Crisis Centers, United States Crisis Centers, International Crisis, Hotlines, Worldwide Emergency Numbers, there's Coping with Suicidal Thoughts, there's a lot of helpful things, there's call lines, text line chats, email chat lines, online chat lines, uh, youth, Canadian, United States, international, live chat rooms, there's Search for a Professional, there's e-counseling, there's coping mechanisms, there's self-management, uh, how I can help someone, warning signs. This, so this website is just absolutely amazing. I looked at it and I'm going to link it to my website. So if you don't get the website, look on my website. I'll probably put it through my Facebook page and just throw it out there so people can have this awesome link to this website. Now, there's some other ones here. Uh, if you are in crisis or if you know somebody's in crisis, Call the National Suicide Line Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK, which is 8255, or contact the Crisis Text Line by texting HOME to 741741. You can reach the Trans, line, trans Lifeline at one 877 five six five eight eight six zero in the US or in Canada it's one eight seven seven three three zero six three six six that's in Canada and then there's a number called the Trevor Project I'm not real sure what it is one eight six six four eight eight seven three eight six there's so many successful stories out there, people with people that have went through with suicide and are survivors and they've, high majority of them have said that I had a second chance and it's it's good to rethink. Like if you're thinking suicide, give yourself a 24 hour window, 
Try to talk to someone. Try, try to reach out for help. I know some people will get very awkward with this. But if you're going to save a life, absolutely talk to them. I've had people text me doing this podcast. And I've texted back on through Facebook. And just for people to know that they're not alone. I'm in a mental health awareness group that has 17,000 people. And I try to reach out to people and I put positive messages when they welcome in the group to make them feel welcome, make them feel a part of a community. A lot of people that have mental health issues or if they're suicidal, they don't feel like they're a part of something. So you have to make people feel a part of something. And that's my biggest thing is make people feel a part of things. Make people feel that they're a part of a community or a part of a group. Bullying, like suicide prevention, bullying should be an everyday, not a once an awareness, one day awareness. It should be everyday awareness to help people, to help people get through traumatic events, to help people get through the things of life. Life is hard. Life is so hard that we have sometimes need a helping hand. And that's okay. We all need helping hands. Myself as a podcaster and, and as a correctional officer, as a father, as a husband, as a family man, as, as a brother, as as a grandson, I needed help. Do I welcome help sometimes? No. But it's just the fact that people know that, hey, someone does care. And it puts that frame of thought. It might bring, It might break that chain of negative thought. So we're coming to the end of the podcast, my conclusion. So... I want to take this opportunity to, again, thank my sponsors, Eastern Tile and Carpet. Patterson Sales and Service for their partnership in breaking the silence and the stigma in mental health. Taking the journey with me. Please check out the local businesses on my website. There's links to the sponsors. If you hit their digital logo, I'll bring it right into their webpage. So I've done that just so you can check them out. I appreciate it if you do. My thoughts are many in regard to suicide. When I hear a young person or a person taking their life through a suicide, it breaks my heart. There's a lot of pre- preventable ways to help people in life with suicide or mental health. We as humans need to support each other and to help with positive words or just listen. I'm having a hard time with this conclusion and all the talk and the different symptoms and the stats. It's really put me in an emotional state. I really had to take time to do my conclusion, as you can see. Uh, loss of words, maybe, caring 100%, or maybe it's the human side coming out of me. But I just want to let people know if they're alone out there, you're not alone. You have people, to people. If you need somebody, please message me on my chat book, uh, Facebook page. Um, you know, I mean, I'll respond absolutely well. Um, if you're alone, I just want you to know that you're not alone. I care. The place is way better with you in it. Having different personalities in the world makes it such a beautiful place to live. And I just want to say that, that I want to say some positive quotes to end my podcast. And there's some ones that I picked that I really like. For instance, place your hand over your heart. Can you feel it? That's called purpose. You're living for a reason, so please don't ever give up. Another one is... Suicide doesn't end the chances of life getting worse. It eliminates the possibility of it ever getting better. Barack Obama says a statement out there. To anybody that's hurting, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. It's a sign of strength. Totally agree with that statement. If your heart is still beating, God is not done with you yet. That's Dylan Burroughs. So, in conclusion, I just want to say a few things. I just want to... Talk about my upcoming podcast. I'm going to try to get Lola. I'm going to talk to her. She's a 16-year-old with a borderline personality that has agreed to talk to me. I talked to her mother, Natalie, earlier. So she's very open to talk about her her challenges with mental health and, and the challenges she has every day as a young teenager, which I'm excited. And there's some other interviews I'm going to line up. And I might talk about correctional, correctional officer suicide which is one of the highest, and I might do a segment on correctional officers in general, just to help with the correctional officers that are out there. I know how hard it is. I know every day we struggle to go to work. We have high stresses, anxiety, 
we deal with negative people. Uh, if people understood what kind of environment the correction officers deal with on a daily basis, they would understand why things happen at certain times. You don't understand how you deal with mental health patients and you try to do your best and you don't have the support or the training or you're not trained in that possibilities. So I'm going to leave that as it is and I'll talk about that in further podcasts. I'm your host, Alan Hilchey. Until next time, this is Chat Club Podcast. And there's only one rule in Chat Club. And that's everybody talks about Chat Club. Until next time, thanks for your support. I'll talk to you real soon.